thanks for coming. Um, so I think we win prize for most people on stage at one time. Um, so I just want to take you through um, a story, really, of, of um, a Cogworks and, and Graham from Smith and Williamson, um, and how we migrated. Yeah, two two sites, four and a half thousand pages in in quite a, a strict time frame that was set by by Smith and Williamson. Um, so just a quick intro to, to us. Um, I'm Adam Shalcross, um, co-founder of the Cogworks. That's me with hair. Um, I'm kind of CTO and jack of all trades at the Cogworks. Been running it for too long. 2006 we started. Um, one of the original Gulf partners. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm here as, as kind of uh, to talk about how the Cogworks interacts with with teams and with clients. I'm Katie. <laughs> I'm a project manager at the Cogworks and um, also project team lead, and I was project manager on this project. And I'm Graham Smiley. I'm obviously the client because I don't have a photograph with a pink flamingo. Um, <laughs> but I look after the creative and digital teams at Smith & Williamson. To give you a bit of background, Smith & Williamson are a um, financial services firm, so we look after rich people's money, so I'll never be a client because I don't have any. Um, but we also do accounting as well, so we're the eighth biggest accounting firm in the UK. Um, so if I give you a bit of background on this project, I guess, why did we choose to change CMS? <clears throat> so I've been with the company for about 20 months, and uh, yeah, the old CMS used to drive us to drink, basically. Uh, it was a a problematic build. The website was only about 12 months old when I joined, um, but it was in a bad state. We had uh, no strong relationship with the agency. I won't mention the CMS that we used, but it rhymed with white floor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was expensive just to have the CMS, so once you threw in hosting costs and license costs, there's additional user costs, it costs us about £100,000 just to have this thing every year. That's without us doing anything on it. Um, the search didn't work on it. We had query string issues. Um, we had problems with deployment. Every time we launched something, something else broke. Um, so for every pound that we spent building something new on the CMS, we had to spend another pound fixing it. So it was just continually firefighting. Um, the original team that built the site left. I don't know if it was on good terms, but it was good for me because I got a job. Um, but somebody said to me, I think it was Adam, there are no bad CMSs, only bad implementations. And I think that's true because I've worked in previous roles where this platform has been in place and it does work, but we had a big problem that we had to fix. Um, so we had three options. We could either carry on firefighting, we could rebuild the website on the existing CMS, or it gave us the opportunity to look to change platform, and that's when we started to look into Umbraco. So I'd used Umbraco in previous roles, but it was version five, um, and uh, I was a bit nervous <laughs> when somebody said we should look at Umbraco again, but the difference between version five and when we looked at it now, it was just incredible. There was so many good things about it. Um, we were looking for a .NET solution. There's a lot of big IT projects going on in a financial services company, and everything's .NET based, so um, it made sense that we all use the same tech. Um, we had recommendations from other people who do similar roles to me, saying actually this is really worth a look. Um, the grid gives a lot of flex for editors because uh, we had about four and a half thousand pages and most of them looked almost identical. Um, it was quick, it was easy to use. So there was lots of good signals coming from Umbraco and one of the big points for us was that there was plenty of gold partners to choose from. So we went out, we knew we were saying goodbye to the previous agency. Um, and we invited three agencies to come in and pitch for the work. And I have to say the Gold Partner Programme really stood out for us because any of the agencies that came to pitch could have done the work. So I'm not saying you're interchangeable, but, um, <laughs> but there were some things that tipped the balance in terms of us deciding to work with Cogworks in terms of building a relationship right from the start. They brought in uh, Katie came into the pitch meetings, uh, Josh from the design team came in, so we could get a real feel for the team that we would be working with on a, on a regular basis. So after a lot of hoop jumping that we put Adam through, we decided to work with Cogworks. 
and it was a great decision. <laughs> <laughs> Which is always quite difficult, because obviously I think probably a couple of the agencies well, that we were up against here, and we know them quite well. So it's in the UK, there's so many gold partners, we're going to come up against each other all the time, but it's kind of a, a friendly rivalry, really. And, you know, for, for me, um, part of the reason why we use Umbraco is, is the community, collaboration, um, you guys, um, everyone being here, um, the UK festival that we run, um, and part of that ecosystem, and, and us giving back um, to Umbraco, makes it better, which makes it better for the clients, and it's that whole kind of self-fulfilling circle of, of um, upgrading and improving that, that makes it such a great platform anyway, and that's, you know, that's why we've got a vested interest in it. Um, but us as a company, um, we have these, these values. Um, the, um, the most important for us, um, honesty, teamwork, and collaboration. Um, honesty from our team, you know, we, we, we Oh, me as a business owner, all of our team, we want them to be honest with our clients. And that's, that's um, there's no point lying because it will come back and bite you at some point down the project. So be upfront, be honest. If problems happen, I tackle them straight away. Don't let them kind of fester. Um, the teamwork and collaboration um, is really important to us as well. We're, we're, we're set up to be collaborative. We've got developers in London. We've got um, a team in Krakow. We've got two developers in Warsaw, where uh, Marcin was, who works, was the tech lead with, with Katie and worked daily with, with Graham here. So, and we've got a developer in Barcelona. So teamwork and collaboration, we're set up for that. All of our tools are. Everything we use is in the cloud. We don't have any hosts, um, any servers hosted locally. So but bringing the client into that team is is you know, the number one priority for us. We need a client to be vested in the project, not just give us a brief, we disappear for three months, come back with something, go da-da, and they go, why have you built that? We didn't want that, that's wrong, and you end up in this client agency argument, which is not good for anybody. Um, and the last one is fun, really, um, enjoyment, and um, part of this presentation is a little bit about that, but, um, but getting the team to enjoy the project as well as the client makes a happier team, everyone's happy, everyone knows what they're doing, everyone has a vested interest to make the product as, as good as, as, as it can be. Um, and every project has challenges, that's, that's the fundamental thing with projects, that's the point, they are a challenge. So the more fun you can make that challenge and the more um, laughs you can have along the way when you get to those challenging moments like the launch, which is always a challenge <laughs> for every project, if you're still smiling at that point, then you, you've clearly done something right as you go through the project. So, so, um, so yeah, that's that's kind of us. So I'll let Graham go on about the, the actual challenge in, in place. So there was a lot of things that we wanted to do with the migration. The brief that we were given was to fix the platform. It was breaking. It was just causing a lot of issues. So rather than just rebuild the thing exactly as it was, it gave us a big chance to improve it in a lot of ways. So, I mean, I mentioned the four and four and a half thousand pages, they pretty much look like this. I mean, it's, a, it's about as boring as a web page can get. Um, the, the best thing was the Twitter feeds, which put a picture on the page. So um, we wanted to fix the design. Um, we had a huge number of duplicate pages, and it's just through the course of time before we joined where we had a .com site, then we had an English and an Irish site, and they didn't properly move pages. They just copied them. So we had seven versions of one service page. It was just difficult. Um, the site was slow. Uh, it wasn't optimized for the search engine, so we ran it through the Google Lighthouse Checker and it came out at 38 out of 100. Um, so we, the only way is up uh, in terms of how we could improve it. Um, as a company, we also write a lot of news, financial news, tax changes. It's not the most exciting, but it is important and we wanted to be able to submit the news that we write to Google News. It's extra traffic. Um, we also wanted a more visually engaging user experience. Um, so there was quite a lot to do. It wasn't just a copy and paste and move it to Umbraco. Um, we had really tight time scales, Adam mentioned it. So we didn't start the build until the middle of January, I think it was, and you had to have it live. The UK and Irish websites live by the end of April. So, yeah, it was good fun. Mm -hmm. um, we also had the eyes of the business on this project because Paige and the team sitting in the front row. We had both joined, and we were fighting against the history of unsuccessful, expensive website projects that overrun on budget and time. So 
there were a lot of people who didn't think that we could pull this off. I think three weeks before I questioned that myself. Um, it was also the first ever um, agile project that the firm had run. So normally they do everything waterfall, we have a big book of what we wanted to do and it, that just wasn't going to work for a website project. Um, Cogworks also had to work alongside our search agency, so we use a third party, um, just to make sure that this was as optimised as it could be for the search engines as we were going through. Um, we also wanted to use a proper taxonomy just to make the site easier to manage, so you pu publish a page once and then you push it out using various tags and keywords. Um, and we're also a very, very heavily regulated industry, financial services, there are so many rules and regulations. And I must apologise to Adam <laughs> and what we put Cogworks through in terms of sending people down to do cyber security tests on their offices. Um, it actually took longer to review the legal contracts. It took four and a half months to review the contracts. We built both websites quicker than it took us to do that part. But once we were through all the hoop jumping, um, that's when things really started to move and we could start with the work. So. I'll leave Katie planning. to talk about the planning. And that's where I come in. Um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, I was the PM on this project, and um, I'm just going to talk about how we approach the plan and the delivery. Um, obviously, in all projects, planning is very important, but especially when you're faced with such a tight time frame to do it in, you've got the added pressure. So, from the initial setup of Umbraco to going live was about 12 weeks. And on top of the actual development and build of the Umbraco site, Smith & Williamson also had to complete the content population. So it meant we were building parts of the site and simultaneously getting the content pop underway. So we take an agile approach to most of our projects. Um, we're constantly planning and reviewing and seeing how we can make the next iteration of work as best as it can be. Um, so we had two websites, we had an English version of the site and an Irish version, so added together four or 5,000 pages, which is quite a lot. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you the site map so you can see this is what Graham sent us. Um, I'd like to add we had an A1 printed version of this, which filled one of the office walls for <laughs> a couple of months. <laughs> um, so from this, we created an initial statement of work which was required by the business, and it was pretty much 30 bullet points, super high level of what would be delivered with this project, header and footer, you know, really high level, but we didn't spec out how everything was gonna work. You know, at the beginning of the project, when you've got the least amount of knowledge, you, you, you learn as you go, and that was something new that Smith & Williamson had, it wasn't a way they'd worked in before, so we really had to prove that working agile does work. Um, so, it can seem quite difficult to know where to start when you're faced with such a massive site migration. So to make it more manageable, we broke it down into sections. So we knew we wanted the grid, um, te certain templates. Hopefully we're logged into stories on board. I don't know if anyone's <laughs> used it, but this is what we use to kind of break down yeah, the, the, the site map into manageable chunks. Hopefully you can see that. So infrastructure forms, um, highlighting if there was third party integration um, that we'd need to work with just so we knew, you know, to, to help plan the time um, for this. So this was the starting point for the content structure. We didn't want to replicate what had already been created before, um, but given the time frame, it wasn't a complete content restructure, but we just made quick wins where possible. Um, and gave advice, um, you know, along the way. So one area where um, we helped kind of the content pop happen a bit quicker was take the insights section, for example, 900 insights, I think. Um, some of these were shared across the England and Ireland site. So we suggested create all of them on your English vers version first, which is kind of the, the, the main site and then copy them into the IE node, so you don't have to content pop twice. And we created a canonical URL field so that we'd be able to point to the original you know, content. Um, so once we'd kind of broken this down, we then created these feature cards, which are the, the smaller ones you can see beneath. Um, and then we transferred that to Trello, and Trello was the tool that we um, used most throughout the, the whole delivery. Um, so, on to delivery, I'd like to say once the planning was done, but 
when you work agile, the planning is constant. You're constantly planning the next sprint, the next sprint of work. Um, but this is how we actually executed what we'd planned. So this is our Trello, Trello board in the height of the project. Loads and loads of cards, uh, lots of colors, labels. Um, all of the designs had been done up front very early on in the project, and they were signed off. And it was really good that we, we had a very engaged client that gave us quick feedback. You had a very clear view of what you wanted, so we were able to get you know, decisions made quickly. So that was the only thing that we'd done up front. Um, in an ideal world, with a build like this, you've got the front end at least one step ahead of the back end. So we, we did all of the front end on a static, and then once that was done, the back end work and the integration would happen. Um, the reason we did it on a static was firstly because it was a very easy way for us to get feedback quickly. We could share the link um, and, and get that signed off. And also, if there were changes that needed to be made, it's a lot easier to, to do that just on a simple static than when you're you know, deep down the rabbit hole, everything's integrated, oh, we don't like this, you know, we're gonna have to go right back. Um, yeah, so in terms of planning, the, the sprints, um, we have the, the sprint backlog and we worked in two week sprints. So at the beginning of the sprint, we'd have a planning session, um, we'd agree with the client what, what we were gonna work on and um, I think it's really important to tackle the highest value stories, you know, highest value features early on um, and that doesn't mean the quickest or easiest for us to do tasks because you know, with content population in mind, we knew that we needed to tackle areas of the site which we could pass over to Smith and Williamson so they could get going on the content pop. So it was constantly striking a balance between you know, having a development plan but also making sure that that coincided with the you know, content plan and, and you were using Trello. Yes, kind of so we were using, we had access to the Trello boards as well which was really helpful. So we were looking at the sort of furthest right two or three columns to work out what was about to be ready or what was going to be ready next week so that I could have more people ready to move 900 pages across quickly if we had to. So <laughs> it, we kind of, we spoke almost daily on the Slack channel, or we did yeah. speak hourly probably. Um, <laughs> but yeah, just constantly to talk to each other so that we know what's coming up next so that we can be ready for it. Yeah, and in terms of, you know, releases, we, we'd planned what we were going to um, deliver within that release, within the sprint, but um, we didn't have a fixed release plan. So if something was ready and complete, we'd push it up to, to get it through. We weren't blocked on that, and I think that was good. So we could deliver quickly and often and, and get things, you know, tested and approved. Um, so this is an example of a feature card, and um, it's made up of a description with technical details and Martin was the tech lead on this project and he provided some fantastic, very clear um, technical details on all of the cards. And so this feature card was split into potentially back end, front end integration. Um, and as soon as an element of that feature was being worked on, the card would go into doing and it would stay there until it was done. So, you know, if there were certain things that weren't complete, it would stay there, um, like on uh, Mastermind, Magnus Magnuson. Um, I've started, so I'll finish. <laughs> Very similar. <laughs> yeah, case here. Um, so that was kind of the Trello process. Here we've got um, an integration card, and we've got acceptance criteria, and that's very important to, to define up front um, and never assume because often the most obvious requirements are overlooked because people assume that, you know, oh, they're going to know that. But it would be, it's much better to, you know, highlight every single small detail and, and cover it than miss it and find out at the end, well, this isn't working how we wanted it to work because we just assumed. So we, we, we were very much looking for acceptance criteria from, you know, Graham and the team and also kind of on how we were planning on how it would work. I think the key from our side as well is getting the QA team involved in writing those acceptance criteria as well. So it was a, a full team effort, the QA team, the client and project management and developers all writing the acceptance criteria. So it's 100% clear, this is what we need to do and this is what will be delivered at the end of it. And then all of those tick boxes can be ticked basically. Yeah. Yeah, I think the Trello feature of the, the checkboxes is a really good way to go through and, you know, clearly test, is this doing what we've set out for it to do? Yes, great. And that's also sometimes 
perhaps you'd get feedback and, and you'd be like, oh, that's not how that works. Um, that, that's a bug and you need to really question, is it a bug or is it a kind of scenario misunderstanding and, and is, is it worth us doing it? Do you need, you know, do you need that to be fixed? Um, when you're defining features, there are a couple of questions you can ask. If something's too vague, um, you should ask how should it work to try and tease out the details. And if it's too complex or way too much details, the question you should ask is why? Why does it need to be like this? And I think often we overcomplicate things. And if we actually think about why does it need to be like this, you know, it, it simplifies it and potentially reduces the time to, needed to complete it. Um, so once we completed the work, once once an item was done, and sometimes as well when things were in progress, we we would have a weekly demo call with the client to show you know this is what we've been working on in this sprint. Um, the editors would join, so Paige was one of the editors, and and they joined the demo, so they're kind of learning because Umbraco is completely new to to the team, so they're learning how the elements are working, I would literally go in and content pop a page. And we'd record this, because we use Zoom, so you can just do a simple screen record. And this acted as a resource for the editors, so they could go back to it. It's also great if people are working remotely or asynchronously. You know, you don't all need to be on that call, but you've got a reference point, um, you know, to come back to. And it acts as a training guide for editors. Um, also, this is the best way of getting feedback quickly. And in the same way that we didn't block releases, we didn't block demoing things. If we had something ready, we were doing daily stand-ups anyway. So we'd just say, hey, we've, we've worked on this. Is this how you want to you know, show them and get quick feedback? And I think that's the key, especially working in Agile. If something's not right, better to find out early on. Um, and communication is a, a, a massive part of the success of a delivery of project, you know, not just going away, um, working on something, and then as Adam says, coming back three months later and it not being the right thing. So, yeah, we had very open communication, um, honest. We were all on a, a, a joint Slack channel and, you know, Graham could speak to me whenever, you know, really. And also, Graham had contact with the developers, so Marchin was on our joint Slack channel. So, you know, if there's a technical conversation that needs to happen, I don't need to be in the middle of that trying to relay information and, you know, so Smith and Williams had direct contact with our devs and we also had direct contact with the um, third party agencies and that was really useful. So, yeah, not, not necessarily having someone being the messenger in the middle. So you get, you get what you uh, need to know quickly. So we encouraged discussion, asking questions, challenging each other about certain things. There was one time I remember we created an accordion module um, and Graham asked if we could use it within a macro, within a copy module, within the grid. And we said, sure, like, you can use it, but the question is, should you? <laughs> I had a bad day. <laughs> um, yeah, you should, you know, just have these conversations. Um, yeah, that's part of the honesty, really. Open. Um, ask, asking why. Yeah. Do you really need it to do that? Yeah, um, I sometimes think... Sometimes it's a prompt to go, actually, no, we don't. And we did appreciate that working together and you know the client is not always right unless we disagree but <laughs> um, you did you did challenges in the right way in a nice way and you know there was never any confrontation throughout the whole thing it was should you really be doing that have you thought about doing it this way and it's that suggestion of a better way of doing it. yeah that, that we don't just want to replicate what's been done um and another really important question so w when you're when you've got a time constraint you know we really did need to just deliver the minimum viable product for you know for launch and often people get kind of bogged down with oh we need this 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 feature and if you want to define or you know establish if something is mvp ask the question are you prepared to delay the launch of the site for this feature if the answer is yes into the MVP column it goes. If the answer is no, it can come later. You know, it's a nice to have. If we've got time, we'll, we'll do it. Um, and the importance of being honest and saying no sometimes. If, if you're asking for something and it's going to take us two weeks and we've only got a week and a half left, no, we can't do that. And the importance of saying no, um, I think, builds trust as well. Because then when you say yes, the client knows you mean it and, you know, you're going to deliver what you say you will. So... Um, if you say yes to everything, though, you end up with the fire festival. So <laughs> there's a there's a balance between you know um, 
committing to everything. It's be much better to know if something's not going to be delivered, find out early on, not when you get to a, a you know, tropical island in Barbados or wherever. Um, we've all got the same shared goal. We all want to deliver the project and deliver the best possible solution, short amount of time, budget. So, yeah, it's just working as a team. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so as I've mentioned a couple of times, teamwork is really important and collaboration. Um, oh, gone too far. Um, for us, um, it means recognising, as I said, that it's made up of more than just developers. And developers like to think they're very special, and they are very special. But we've also got project managers, we've got content editors, we've got the client, we've got design team. <coughs> um, so the team is literally everyone, and everyone should be involved in it. It includes, also includes stakeholders as well. There's obviously, um, Graham is, is on the ground with Paige, doing the work, but Graham has people to answer to further up the organization, and they need to be, um, need to be invested in the project. But um, the thing that made this team, this project run so well was, was Graham being allowed to make decisions and Smith and Williamson trusting him to go yes and no. Um, without that person or the, um, uh, what's it called? Product owner. Product owner. Um, <laughs> to make that decision, that's what, allows projects to kind of get drawn out and if there's this whole um, approval process that has to go on, it just um, causes unnecessary delays. Um, and forming a genuine partnership as well, establishing the core values for how you work together. Um, that's really important for any projects. Um, one of the things that we did, we, we run the UK festival. Um, uh, it, it was timed just as we were doing the design phase, I think, mm -hmm. so just as contracts were going through. But we invited Paige and, and Graham to, to the festival. Um, so having a beer and doing karaoke at the festival helped build that relationship. I know it seems like a funny thing, but actually just going out, having a, a chat or something, just build that um, kind of relationship before you started. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely the teamwork and collaboration side of it from, from a Cogworks perspective just, just makes, makes projects run um, way more smoothly. Um, so yeah, great. <coughs> So, very pleased with, I think the website went live on the f Friday the 3rd of May. Mm. It went live at half Friday past... Friday before the bank holiday. <laughs> yes. always, a, always a good Sorry time to <laughs> um, I think it went live at half nine and then we wound it back for an hour, so we, we showed a bit of ankle. But it was live by half past ten. Um, but just delighted with the end result. I mean, from an editor's point of view, it's so much quicker um, to get pages live. Um, no formal training, so we've... Uh, trained up whole teams around the business, there's no extra license costs, um, and f often for the training, we just sent them a link to the video clip to watch it. It really was that easy compared to a previous supplier. Um, four and a half thousand pages. We didn't move them all because we didn't need to. We had seven versions of some of them, we had three of others, so we've now got um, a much, much better site structure. Um, it's all in .NET, so if we get future plans and we want to integrate and build on it, that gets a lot easier. Um, we <laughs> you took great delight in sending a screenshot of the Google Lighthouse report for the new site because it went from 32 out of 100 to 98. So not quite perfect, but uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really, really good result. Um, and we had some really good feedback from the business because this is the first project in the firm's history because it was founded in 18 something something that um, had launched on budget and on time and it was really intense in the last three weeks in terms of lots long days and hours p from a content pop point of view just getting everything done I know you guys were working weekends I think, as well I don't think Martin's recovered yet <laughs> <laughs> three, three, three bottles of vodka later and he's still stressing <laughs> yeah I mean we can't thank you enough because the the credit you get from being able to make that claim of the first ever project that has actually worked um, has gone down so well. My favourite comment we had in an email was, we've earned beers and a seat at the table of all-time Smith & Williamson legends. So mm -hmm. I think that's about as, as good as the comments could get. I guess, key to Yeah, I suppose a part of that, obviously being an Embraco talk, um, the way Embraco works um, and the way it's flexible, um, the way you can adapt it um, allowed the project to run as smoothly as it did, allowing us to deliver sections or build a particular doc type, deliver it to, to Graham. They can content pop. 
um, we can be working on the next section or doing the front end and connecting it at the same time. And it's that kind of constant um, ability to, to flex and mold the project around the features, so using you know, agile. Agile concepts and, and all the stuff that Katie's been through um, just allows that flexibility without having a rigid structure of, of the old um, waterfall-y style where you've got a 200-page um, a functional specification and you have to deliver all that. And as well, as soon as you've as soon as you finish that functional spec, it's kind of it's out of date because as soon as you start the project, someone's got oh, what about this? And and you know that's that's the beauty of, of Embraco and the beauty of agile projects really is that flexibility, but with control around it. It's not a, a free reign just to do everything and anything. It has to have um, the regular meetings, the regular demos, um, all of the stuff, the client engagement, the communication, the collaboration, all of those things um, molded together with a great team um, from a technical project management and a client perspective. Just you know, it was a it was a, a picture project, I suppose, really from. Um, but it's not the only one we've done. We do lots of other picture projects as well. But obviously, Graham's our favourite client. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, so kind of key takeaways from from this project. Um, yeah, the MVP was really important yeah. um, to to define and get um, get delivered. Um, don't try and build Rome in a day. Agile new approach for the third. <laughs> that was you, wasn't it, Graham? What was that? That's your one. The top one. Oh, don't build one a day. Yeah, every every project is um, waterfall based. So there's a project on the go at the moment, and the requirements document is about three inches thick. So yeah, don't do it all at once. Do little and often, and get the basics right and build from there. Mm -hmm. And yeah, work out what you actually need for launch. It's very easy to make the decisions that the when you've only got a week. Yeah. Do we actually need this? No, get rid of it. If you can do that in the first week, then you've probably got time at the end, maybe for the nice. And it was just doing the 30 bits. bullet points. We knew the basics that we needed to get this moved over, but we could sort of tweak yeah. criteria as long as it wasn't in the doing column on Trello. Yeah. We could still have a chat about yeah, yeah. can we adapt this? So sort of really and things flexible. are constantly changing. You know, from the beginning, you know, three months later, things still might change. And if you've agreed and signed in blood, this is what we're going to do, then it's not a particularly adaptive way of working. Yeah, it's a partnership, as mentioned. The client's success is yours too. That's a nice line. <laughs> um, Agile, as I mentioned, works. As I said we've got developers all over the place, distributed teams. It's, it's the communication that matters. And, and the great tools there are these days, so Slack, Trello, um, Zoom, Hangouts, all of those things that I'm sure you will use anyway. But, um, but trusting those technologies and having them um, work and obviously our, from a tech perspective, the deployment practices, um, build servers, we've got all our stuff in Azure, um, the main sites hosted in Azure as well, so using all of the cool tools that Azure have got for, for deploying using web apps, you know, the whole infrastructure and, and, and getting to know it really and, and, and trusting it and, and knowing that it works. Um, don't leave content until the end, that was really key for this project, but key for, we, it's probably the fourth or fifth project we've run in this way. Um, a couple of the other ones had quite tight timescales as well. Um, but it really does work. And as I mentioned, the flexibility of Embraco allows you to do that. You don't have to build the whole site, sign it all off, and then start content pop. The, the, the problem with doing that is you will always run into content that doesn't quite fit where you thought it was going to. Then you've got to go back, potentially rework that bit or that page or that section again to try and fit this bit of content in. The beauty of adding the content as you go is you can see where the gaps are. So even if it's a news article, you know you've got the headline, the body text. It may be that you've got a thumbnail, um, but there may be a panel there that may be the latest news panel or um, related stories um, that isn't built yet, but you can see the page and you've got a hole. You know you need to come back to that point because you know you've got a feature on the backlog that that will fill at some point in the future. So, so it really quickly allows you to see. And you can show to the business earlier. They can see it. They can get buy-in as well. So. Um, so yeah, that, that's really it's really fundamental to running projects that way. Keep laughing, the fun. <laughs> We're still having fun. <laughs> I had hair at the beginning of the project, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's as I mentioned, just having fun. And always go for a beer at the start and end of a project. We haven't had a beer. Have we had a beer at the end, or is this the beer at the this end? Is, this, this is the beer, is beer at the end. end. Yeah. Not there in a minute. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's it. That's our story. Um, hopefully, there's some <laughs> stuff in there that um, that you can take away. Any questions? Yes. John. I just had a simple question, really. Um, when you guys were picking the keep in, you know, your question, do we need this for the launch for the MVP? Out of curiosity, how much ratio kind of do you think actually got left out? 
so I would say like some some of the bits which you were like really really want this. Yeah. We're doing them now. Yep. You know, it's 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 live, but they weren't essential for hitting the deadline. The so. Of the thirty points that we had established, all of those got delivered. But it's just the way that we delivered it. You know, yeah. we maybe had to strip back some of it to get it done. Al always reduce the scope first, then extend the time. Yeah. Yeah. I think we had um, there's about three weeks worth. Yeah. That's, that's how little there was left to do. And yeah. it's real small bits. It's niggly bits. Yeah, you wouldn't notice they're missing on the website. Fantastic. But it is key, and the communication is key, because you can ask the question, did, does it... Part of the Agile process is you say, you know, we T-shirt size, so small, medium, large, and if you see something's actually taking longer than you thought, you can... Having the communication and the daily stand-up with the client is going, look, this is actually taking longer. Does it need to be this complex? Can we, um, can we just stop, have a rethink, do it in a, in a simple way. I always use this analogy. So we were asked to build a, 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 um, a donation thermometer for a, a charity website. There's obviously two ways of looking at that. You could have um, the complex way, which is integrating the donation management system, the telephone call center internally at the charity, loads of data feeds coming in, a month's worth of development um, to make the thermometer move up by a thousand pounds. Or in the back office of Mbraco, you can have a text box you can type in 100 pounds and hit publish. You know, there's, you get the same result, you've still got the thermometer that moves up, but there's two totally different ends of the scale of complexity. So, you know, is, do you need to do the month's worth of stuff and waste a month's worth of budget, or can you just spend a day now and maybe do that month's worth in, in three months' time or a year's time, but you could spend that, that month's budget on other stuff that may be more important. So it's, it's always asking those questions, really, and, and, and being honest, really, and just saying, and being upfront. I think as well, like maybe if you've left something out, you also need to look at what you've gained. So you might have started off here, but you've got this much more, but this much less of that. You know, it's kind of like a balance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Cool. Um, listen, to that was really interesting. We've just launched uh, the website for the, for the CBI, and we pretty much followed everything you just done with the client being on Slack, Trello. The whole the whole thing was really really. Uh, similar, especially with, they had so much content, we had to build certain parts of the website first that they could contact part, which was, I don't know if you had that, but it was really, really challenging with the way it could potentially change. Mm -hmm. um, my question is that, for us, we had a fixed budget um, from the client, so it was really, really easy, and we had to keep on top of, of creep. Um, yeah. So I was just wondering, what, what, how you handled that? Did you handle it, did you do it on a fixed term, or did you have... Uh, uh, you know, so a um, budget, or did you? Yeah, it's a fixed budget. We had to fix the budget, so the statement of work had um, had loose. It wasn't, as I said, it was, it's not a big functional spec because that takes you longer to write anyway. So, so I suppose it's you, the user stories or the features or a list of things that we said we were going to deliver. But working with Graham and the, and, and the client, you need you need them to be bought into the process. You know, the, ideally we would deliver everything. So beforehand we would t-shirt size everything and come up with a you know a budget based on the t-shirt sizes which to be fair are usually fairly accurate um, as you go through the project you can refine it um, so you know you've got X amount left so we have Katie did burn down charts and all that sort of stuff so you know oh, ideally you've got zero budget and zero features left at the end and it's the ideal Nirvana but obviously it never quite happens like that but if you can get as close to it as possible but having buy-in from the client really is, is the main thing and them understanding the you know, you've got the triangle of features, cost, and time. You can't fix all three. You're just never ever going to get anywhere doing that. Um, so having the client understand that, yes, you can have fixed budget, that's great, but your features need to flex. So that, that's kind of what, what we've said. The MVP is the MVP-ish. Show me, show me a client that doesn't try and ask for a little bit more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it, it's down to, again, communication and having a... Some clients won't. We work with clients who won't. They're going, no, we, you've said you're going to deliver all this, and, you know, that's a commercial decision at that point. And whether you go, all right, we'll do the extra week because it's a commercial decision. We like the client. We know we're going to get a lot more work for it. Um, so it, it kind of takes it out of the project realm and into, you know, can we afford it or not realm. Um, but generally, communication, working with the flex of the features. Like I said, you, you, you'll get the feature. It may not work in quite the way you want it to right now, but we can adapt it in the future. And for us, it's not a project. It's not just that there you go. There's the project. It's delivered. Walk away. See you in two years' time. 
for us, we've got support maintenance with, with, um, with Smith & Williamson. We've got an event section planned. We've got personalization coming up soon. So we've got the fundamental building blocks there in now. Um, but now the, you know, the real work starts now, really, is, is evolving it and iterating over the next, well, hopefully, many years. Mm. One over there. Um, I have a question about uh, how you fit in the quality insurance process into the projects. When is the sweet spot to start uh, queuing and um, what is the ratio of the estimate that it gets? I'm going to try and find the Trello slide because... So when, once a task goes into doing, it's worked on by the devs, it then goes into code review, so all of our code is, is peer reviewed um, and then once the devs are happy with it, it then goes into QA and our QA team follow the acceptance criteria checklist, making sure that it's working as expected and test it there and then we send it over to Smith & Williamson to do like a UAT. So we've got a dev environment, a staging environment and a UAT environment. So, But because we're demoing a lot, but even before it's in that QA column, it's kind of already tested and, and you know, it's, it's throughout the process. But once it's been through code review, that's when it goes into QA. Yeah, let's maybe have two levels of QA as well because we test the, the static HTML as well. So that kind of goes through the QA process before it gets integrated into Umbraco as well. So we've kind of got captured some of it there in terms of layout and styling and, um, and the template kind of flow, um, but then we, do it again when it gets integrated into a Braco as well. So, thank you. Any more? Cool. Thank you for coming. Thank you.